Morning, we heard from former Governor Bob Early on aspects facing our country and Congress. And this week we'll turn towards the state government, and I'm sure our speaker will also touch on a few federal issues as well. Our speaker today is like that favorite guest host of Saturday Night Live. You know, the one that keeps coming back again and again. again. And I think, Bert, maybe we should start charging him some dues. <laughs> this is probably Terry's 15th time addressing our club. And there's a reason why this room is full every time he comes, and we ask Terry to come back each year. He's an outstanding presenter that gives us history and facts and builds context to on our, principal, on our political world without any kind of partisan slander. Terry is titling his talk, uh, The Six-Year Itch, Politics, Policies, and Personalities. For Terry's and guests, please warmly welcome our friend, the Director of the Center for Politics and Public Affairs at Franklin Marshall College, Dr. Terry Dada. Thank you. Actually, I come back because I want to restart the War of the Roses <laughs> across the river, but I've been un unable to do this. By the way, I could probably assist you in writing your history since I've spent so much time over here. <laughs> the other point I would make is I have no clue what preceded me. I have a bag of garbage a day. I want to get it down to a month. And I love your elections. You want to be around for faculty elections? Uh, they can get petty and brutal. And as Senator Pat Moynihan once said, the reason that faculty activities and debates are so petty and venal is that the stakes are so small. <laughs> I'm, 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 and I'm not even going to go near this discussion of, of runways and models. <laughs> uh, uh, professors have tenure, but that may go above and beyond what, what could happen. At any rate, I am delighted to be here, and the title for my talk, you know, which I've been giving this year is a six-year itch. I want to assure you it's not a dermatological problem, so you don't have to start scratching. But the reason that's the case is that, for the most part, presidents in modern history who've been able to seek and win a second term simply have trouble by the time they reach the sixth year. If you go from Harry Truman up through Barack Obama in only one of those elections, in only one of the six-year you know, midterm election, in only one, has the party that's held the presidency picked up seats in Congress. And that was Bill Clinton in 1998, in the midst of prosperity, but also in the midst of something, wait a minute, how do I phrase this? Someone called Monica Lewinsky <laughs> and impeachment. Oh, by the way, I have to stop here for a moment. So the college students, 1998 or eight and nine, so you're in a discussion about Bill Clinton's second term. There's a lot of serious stuff going on, you know, whether he lied in a civil trial or not. I thought everybody lied in a civil trial, by the way. <laughs> but he's accused of lying, you know, what is the definition of his, and the House impeaches him, and he's got this problem with Monica Lewinsky. And I go home one day and I say to my wife, how do I, explain this. How do I talk to kids, students, who don't know anything about it? You'll love this Mr. Superintendent. <laughs> she says, don't worry, honey. They know more about that than you do. <laughs> <laughs> so I move on. At any rate, at any rate let, me, let me just say a little something about the current national situation, and then we'll talk a bit about uh, Governor Corbett. Of course, I think you have somebody. You have somebody over in York County? Yeah. You might be running for governor. Yeah, I wonder who that could be. At any rate, we'll talk about that in a minute. So, look, six years, Ronald Reagan had something called a run. Well, let's go back. A guy named Richard Nixon had to leave the presidency because of the cover up of Watergate in August 1974. A guy named Ronald Reagan ran into something called the Iran Contra. I won't get into the details of that. Bill Clinton had impeachment and, and Monica Lewinsky. Second terms, sixth year, dreadful. Part, and, and in the case of the current president, I don't think there's any doubt that his job performance numbers have dropped sharply. When he was, the month after Barack Obama took office, in, uh, after his reelection in 2013, his job performance was 54% positive on the average, and I use the average of polls as a pollster, always leery of 
any individual poll, including my own, it's now 40% positive. So we're talking about a drop of 14 percentage points. Some of that had to do with NSA, it had to do with the IRS, it had to do probably less with the Benghazi situation, but noticeably, and I'm not going to get into the rightness or the wrongness of the Affordable Care Act, but there isn't any doubt that the implementation of it has been slightly short of disastrous. And that has cost the president a tremendous amount of support, particularly among swing voters, independent voters, and young voters that traditionally have supported the president in very large numbers. So we got the president's job performance numbers uh, almost in the tank. And the real question moving ahead is whether he ends up like Bill Clinton and Ronald Reagan, meaning that this is a blip, that somehow over the next couple of years he could overcome what's, for the most part, a single issue driving his low job performance, or whether this becomes a huge issue next year in the 2014 election, and whether or not given the Congress that we have, the divided Congress, and I'll talk about that in a moment, he can overcome it and have something of a successful second term. He also has done something that other presidents have done, and it's not worked out, and that is a very aggressive second term agenda. Climate change, energy, immigration, we can go through the things that the president would like to do, and there's virtually no success for presidents after the midterm election, regardless of their political situation, mostly because Congress has moved on to the presidential election, the voters of our country have moved on. We're already debating whether Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton, you know, become the Democratic nominee. By the way, let me say that we want this. We want this, and well, we want both of them to run for the presidency. They both have roots in Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, Biden was uh, born in Scranton, lived there until he was 10. He gets back there frequently. Arlen Specter used to tell me that he was Pennsylvania's third senator. I don't know that everybody else appreciated that. <laughs> but he's a Delaware guy. You know, the Philadelphia media market covers, the, De the Philadelphia television market covers Delaware and southern New Jersey, as well as 40% of the voters of our own state. Hillary Clinton's dad was a standout football player at North Grand High. He then went to Penn State, where he was a football player before he moved to, to Scranton. And their family owned uh, a cottage on a lake that I've never seen outside of Scranton Lake Winola, and Hillary turned over the uh, ownership of the cottage to her brothers in February of this year. Aren't you happy with all this great? <laughs> <laughs> but here's the reason. We will have, we could have a five-week Demo Democratic primary as we had with Obama and Clinton, and the only reason I want that it's a full employment bill for me. <laughs> yes, who wins? I'm just joking. But that would be truly an interesting primary and one worth, you know, paying a lot of attention to and having fun with. We have to have some fun out of this. All right. So here's the, pro the problem that the president also has. He's going to face a divided Congress. In order to win the House, the Democrats have to win 17 seats. 17 seats. There is no analyst in the country who believes the Democrats are going to win 17 seats. It's not going to happen. Maybe three or four before the Affordable Care Act problem. After the government shutdown, the Republican brand, congressional brand, dropped like a rock. The Democrats had an eight percentage point uh, edge in what we call the congressional ballot question. That's important. If the election one day we go for a Democrat for Congress or a Republican for Congress. The Democrats had an eight point edge. Today, as a result of the debate over the Affordable Care Act and implementation, the Republicans have a two point edge. But regardless of that, because of redistricting, translation gerrymandering, there are only about 40 competitive congressional seats in the entire country. And I'll make a prediction. We have 18 members of Congress, this state, right now, 18, 13 R's, six D's, not a single one will lose. Not a single one will lose in the re-election this year. I rarely make these kinds of predictions. So the fact of the matter is that the House is likely to stay the same, which means they're not going to do very much to help the President out with his agenda, which they don't agree with. Over in the Senate, 
The Republicans need to pick up six seats in order to take control. And the problem that the Democrats have there, and I don't know that it won't, I, if I had to say now, I'd say it's 50-50. In seven of the seats that Democrats, Democratic senators are seeking re-election, they were won in 2012 by Mitt Romney. And they're all, they can't get amendments fast enough to postpone the Affordable Care Act, you know, in order to abate the damage that the rollout has caused to, uh, uh, to uh, the President and to Democrats in Congress. Now, lastly on this, before I turn to our own state, no one knows whether the Republicans have gotten themselves into a trap on the Affordable Care Act, meaning what happens if next October it's working? What happens if people actually can sign up? What happens if all of a sudden it makes sense to the young immortals, the people I spent my life with, you know, the 18 to 24 year olds who, you know, who, who knows what they think about, but I don't think it's worrying too much about health insurance, probably <laughs> some test on that, but you get the point. And it doesn't work unless young, healthy people sign up to take care of the older folks, the sicker folks, and particularly because of the expanded coverage that people have to have for all sorts of, of, uh, of health care coverage that they didn't have insurance policy before. We just don't know. And then the other point on this, and I'll end with this, is the state of the economy. Ronald Reagan, a Republican, and Bill Clinton, a Democrat, both had serious problems. But the one thing they had in favor that the president doesn't have is they had a roaring economy in the late in the late 80s and a roaring economy in the late 90s. When we were producing three and four hundred thousand jobs, that new jobs a year, when GDP growth was three and four percentage points, in one year in the 1980s it reached eight percentage points uh, in one of the quarters of job growth, GDP job growth after the 1982 recession. We're limping along now with what some economists call the new normal. Not a lot of big job growth, not a lot of change in the economy with a lot of people still suffering the ravages of the recession. So we'll have to wait and see. If I had a guess, I'd guess there's no way, meaning nothing's coming to hit one of the two parties in the face. In 94, the wave hit the Democrats. Newt Gingrich and the Republicans took control of both houses. In 06, the wave hit the Republicans. Katrina, the Iraq War, Democrats stormed back into power. In 2010, the way went the other way, at least in the House, where the Republicans swept back into control of Congress in the, in the lower House. Now it looks like every one of these battles that will take place in the states, for the United States Senate, third of the Senate, and governors, all the governors in the state except two, as you know, well know, New Jersey and Virginia, which elections which we just went through will be up and up for grabs. Now let's talk about Governor Corey and what's going to happen. First of all, I'm going to lay out the basic facts. Here are the basic facts. Governor Corbett's job performance is the lowest of any <coughs> governor seeking re-election in modern history. There is no doubt about this. Not one poll, but multiple polls. On average, about a third of the voters in our state give him a positive job performance. At this point in the re-election, <coughs> Tom Ridge was over 50% Republican. You know, I'm being nonpartisan about this. Edward Dell, Democrat, above 50%. On election day, on election day, Tom Ridge's job performance was above 60% when he was reelected in 1998. Edward Dell's was about 56, 57% when he was reelected uh, in uh, 2006. You know, he defeated that guy who was a pretty good football player, Lynn Swan, not the best candidate, but that's another matter. Fact is, Governor Corbett's job performance is not very good. That is why, as we sit here today, we have something we have not had in modern Pennsylvania history. Eight declared candidates in the other party seeking to replace the governor. In, all, in, almost, in almost all of the previous re-elections for governors, the out party had to find and beg someone to run. Uh, a guy named Dick, Dick Thornburg had a member of Congress named Alan Erdl from the Williamsport area. Alan who? That's what the voters say. Uh, a, guy named Tom Rid uh, a, a guy named Tom Ridge had a Democratic lawmaker 
state lawmaker from Pittsburgh by the name of Ivan Itkin, a nuclear physicist in the state legislature. There's an anomaly there. <laughs> <laughs> and it was Ivan who again? <clears throat> this year, Democrats are giddy about the prospect of defeating Governor Corbett because of his low job performance. Well, what's at the root of this? What's at the heart of Governor Corbett's job performance? Let me just go through it. First of all, in all fairness to the governor, there isn't any doubt that he inherited a very tough problem. A $4.2 billion deficit. Everybody understands this. $4.2 billion. Rightly or wrongly, in the 2010 election, the election which swept the Republicans back into the federal house, which swept them back into the state house, in 2010, our state house with the biggest majority any party has had since the 1950s, 112 Republicans to 91 Democrats, in an election in which almost all of the Republicans were saying no tax hikes, no fee hikes, balanced budgets, in fact, spend less this year than we did the year before. Governor Corbett, rightly or wrongly, made that pledge. He inherited a $4.2 billion deficit. But there was something else, in all fairness to the governor. The, the legislature, the legislature left Governor Corbett, Edward Dell and the legislature left Governor Corbett with an unusual situation. They took the one-time stimulus money that had been passed by Congress and backfilled many parts of the Pennsylvania budget with one-time only money. So not only does the governor inherit a budget, but he inherits a deficit, he inherits a budget that's backfilled with money that's going to go away. Now in business, I think he's got two problems, you see? He's got to worry about $4.2 billion, then he's got to worry about the money that goes away. In education, it was almost a billion dollars for the school districts. So not only then does he have to worry about the increase in cost for state government, pensions, health care, you can go through the list of them, but he's got to replace the billion dollars. And then he made a pledge that he wouldn't raise anybody's taxes with a $4.2 billion deficit. So having put himself in the legislature, a Republican legislature was right in line with this, they ended up spending less in Governor uh, Corbett's first year of budget than they did in the previous year. So you can see where this is all going to go. A billion dollar cut to basic ed, school districts. 18, 19% respectively to the state-owned colleges, universities, ship over here in Millersville, across the river, my old school, where I, where I live. State related, 19% cut, that's Pitt, Penn State, Temple, and Lincoln. These are not little cuts when you're talking about 20% uh, uh, of, 25% of somebody's budget. These are pretty big cuts. 10% to county human services. Ask folks who work in the counties about that. In the next year, what the governor did was to hold everybody harmless. The legislature said, we'll give you the same amount of money last year. This year, a modest increase. So now we get to the heart. There are probably four or five reasons for why the governor is in trouble. But let me go to the big one. Well, there are three or four big ones. Let me go to one. <laughs> there we there. I'll get him out of trouble in a minute. I'll, I'll resurrect him for you Republicans, so we can Get him out of trouble. So here's what it is. In the polls that I've done and others have done, they started to reflect something I've never seen in 20 years, three years of polling. Education ranked as number one priority, number one issue confronting the state. Got it? Economy and education, almost the same. Now you know what we throw in that? We have 500 school districts in the state. I'll bet you 250 of them beginning in August up through September, started to announce cuts, cuts to English program, or cuts to music, cuts to art, staffing cuts, layoffs of teachers, all this stuff. Kids came back to schools, and what did they hear? What were their parents hearing about the dilemma that schools face? Now, I'm not going to get into the issue for the moment of who's right and who's wrong about the blame for the education cuts. I already laid out the problem that the governor had. Riddell spent his last year in office not helping the Democratic candidate, Dan Honorado, by running around the state arguing for an income tax hike. I'm not going to wonder whether the income tax is right or wrong. I'm merely going to say that there was no way the state was going to get out of the problem it faced, given 
what the legislature and the Governor Rinell have done with backfilling the budget and the deficit without cuts or raising money. You can't, one of the two things have to happen. So the long and the short of this is, Governor Rendell's leading problem is the cuts to education, and that began to hurt him in the polls. The second problem he has, and I'll be honest about this, and I'm quoting Republicans now, he just is awful at communicating. As Joe Scarnati, the Republican leader in the, in, the, in the Senate said, the governor has a story to tell, he just hasn't been able to tell it yet. <laughs> this is a Republican saying, it's not Terry McDonald. It's a Republican saying, he just has a story to hear. And I don't know what that's about. I've interviewed him on Pennsylvania newsmakers a bunch of times. Personally, I find him very warm and very friendly. He just doesn't seem to be candid to be able to explain what he's trying to do. And that's a problem because we, we've had some pretty good communicator, Edwin Dell. He could charm the venom out of a cobra and not get bit, whether he's accurate or not, or truthful or not, it's another man. <laughs> but let's be honest, nobody can argue that Edwin Dell isn't, isn't very skillful. Tom Ridge was very good, very good. Dick Thornburg, Bob Casey, they were all, Governor, Governor Corbin is just not very good at it. And, and we're all trying to figure this out. Is this, well, because, he was this career-long prosecutor. I don't know if there are any lawyers in here. I don't care. Uh, is it because, well, well, we don't want to say too much. You know, we're prosecutors. We don't want to give, you know, got to be careful. I don't know if that's it or his personality. But he's not going to communicate. I'm going to go to the third one. How many Penn State alums are in this room? Put your hands up. He's got very serious Penn State problems. And I don't mean just because a woman named Kathleen Kane, the new Attorney General, actually almost a year in office now, ran on the platform, number one, that Tom Corbett postponed the indictment, the prosecution of Jerry Sandusky because he did not want to anger the Penn State nation, as we call it, in the midst of his gubernatorial campaign, therefore leading to not one victim, but nine others. Kathleen Kane, on the record, said repeatedly he probably played politics with the Sandusky investigation. Okay. So then we got some other problems. The whole, the whole business with the Louis Free report. Louis Free is the FBI director. He is hired by Penn State to produce this report. It, it laid blame at the administration. A bunch of administrators, three of whom are going to go on trial next year. Former administrator and of course to the idol, Joe Paterno. And then we all know what happened to Joe, to, to Joe Paterno, what happened to him at Penn State, the statute. That led to the NCAA sanctions. I pulled on those, and the voters of this state were appalled at these NCAA, and the one they were appalled most at was taking the 10-year win-loss record away from uh, the students who had nothing to do with this. And the voters of our state don't understand the governor agreed with this. The governor agreed with the free report. And then six months later, he goes into federal court and says, no, 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 the uh, NCAA sanctions are too, are, should be revoked. After agreeing to it as a member of the board, you begin to see the problem. There's this inconsistency and something else that none of us realized until after the election last year. We were all sort of shocked, not that Kathleen Kane won, but that she led the ticket, getting more votes in this state than Bob Casey, who won by 9 percentage points, and Barack Obama, who won re-election by winning this state by 5.2 percentage points. She won by 13 percentage points. So afterwards, you know, how the hell did this happen? Yes, she ran against the old boys network in Harrisburg, and that's always a fun thing to do. A little bit of uh, truth to that, by the way. You know, about uh, the way Harrisburg runs. A lot of truth to that. But how did she do so well? So I get out, I, well, we start to find out that thousands of Penn State alums, led by powerful and prominent Penn State alums, one a certain former football player at the at Penn State, who was a pretty good football player at, uh, at, at, uh, for the Pitt Steelers with Franco Harris, was leading a movement to elect her because she was using the issue of her election based on what? Based on Tom Corbett's activities surrounding the whole Penn State business. 
So I get out the map of the state and I start to look at the percentages. She's a woman, she's from Lackawanna County, former assistant DA. I saw, well, the biggest percentage, and her dad, her husband, very prominent business guy, they're very wealthy. And I thought, well, the biggest percentage vote she has to have is from Lackawanna, right? Of course. So I start to look. And it was pretty big up there. The biggest percentage vote that Kathleen Kenny got out of any county was a place called Center County. Now I wonder what the hell is in Center County. <laughs> and I'm trying to figure it all out. And that, you know, sort of put the bow on that. So he's got the Penn State problem. The failure to communicate. Now, we did get a pretty big victory with the transportation bill. He has three big priorities, transportation, 2.3 billion. That's popular with the voters. The roads and bridges need to be fixed. Uh, and we'll see about pensions. I think they're gonna move on pension reform. Mr. Superintendent may get some help there. Pension reform. We also have the business of liquor privatization, which I don't think the legislature is gonna do. Now, let me give him some help, and then I'm going to move on to the Democratic candidates. I'll do that quickly. Here's the point. Governor Corbett will raise a lot of money. The Democrats could have a bitter internecine primary, and I'll come to them in a minute. Additionally, we don't know a year away what issues will actually be relevant. We don't know if the legislature can find a way to do something about education funding which would be the biggest political help to him, given the fact that they're probably going to have a $500 million deficit for other reasons other than the economy, for just other reasons that, are, that I won't get into that, were, that are relevant to the budget. And so it's a long way off. Governor Corbett does not match up well with some of the Democratic candidates, I'll be very honest with you, but it's a long way off. And now let me, for five minutes, turn to the Democrats. The Democrats have eight announced candidates. And I sort of put them on tiers based on, on the ability to raise money, based on uh, the, the ability to gain support. On the top, there are probably four Democrats on the top tier. Allison Schwartz, she's a Democratic Congresswoman. Uh, she represents the 13th Congressional District. It's half in Montgomery County, half in Philadelphia. Uh, the Corbett administration would probably like to run against her the most because she's considered to be the most liberal. I don't think that's true in fact, but the most liberal of the Democrats. She ran in 2000 for the U.S. Senate and didn't win the Democratic nomination. Uh, she'll be able to raise a lot of money. The second one also on that tier would be the current state treasurer, Rob McCord. He's been elected twice to a statewide office. He was a uh, uh, he's a multi-million dollar business guy like somebody else I'm going to talk about in a minute who uh, made a lot of money in investments. He's uh, been very successful as state treasurer. Uh, he's got no, nothing in his background that leads anyone to believe that he would have a problem. He also was not in the legislature or in Congress. And you know what that means? Thousands of votes that can be picked out and used against you. Tax, you know, tax votes or other votes that you cast that you may have cast just for a variety of reasons, which is the problem that, that Congresswoman Schwartz might have. The third, the third candidate is Katie McGinty. She was in uh, one of uh, Governor Riddell's environmental protection secretaries. She's uh, worked for Bill Clinton and worked for Al Gore, so we might see Bill Clinton come in the state and campaign for her. She's very articulate. Uh, I've interviewed her a number of times. Uh, uh, she's very smart. Uh, she's also gaining some momentum. And then the fourth candidate on the top tier, of course, is York County's Tom Wool, who's, as, and you know him better than I do, got, I don't, we'll see if the state's ready to elect someone with a PhD. So it doesn't matter. Uh, I, may, I may run if that's the case. <laughs> uh, I don't think there's any doubt that Tom has a great reputation Revenue Secretary, very successful business guy over here. He's uh, got a lot going for him. The one, uh, he understands the issues. He's putting out policy positions uh, pretty regularly. Uh, I don't know that he's doing a lot of interviews right now that may be by design. We're still not into the year in which this election will take place. Uh, 
So I would put those those four on the top tier, and the other three I'm not I'm, because of time I'm not going to talk about. Well, John Hanger was a DDP secretary. He's also a very bright guy. We have a county commissioner from Lebanon County. We also have a, a Baptist minister from Mechanicsburg. So we've got and the mayor of Allentown at Pulaski. So this is a very crowded field with a variety of backgrounds. Now here's what's fascinating. If you put all their pictures on a wall, they agree on 80 to 85 percent of the issues. They're cultural liberals, pro-abortion, pro-gay rights, pro-gun control. Strong on the environment, you know. Some of them wanted, almost all of them I think want to do fracking, but they want to make sure that you know the environmental protection stuff is there. They want to increase the minimum wage. They want to increase education. See what I mean? What's going to be interesting is how they differentiate themselves from each other. And you know what that boils down to in these kind of campaigns? You have enough money to take your case to the people. There's where Wolf is obviously going to have an advantage, having pledged $10 million of his own money. You need $5 million spent on the six television markets of this state to have any kind of reasonable presence past gubernatorial elections we're talking about 15 to 20 million. I'm glad you see it. <laughs> Edward Dell raised $42 million in his first race for the governorship in 2002, followed up by 30 million in 2006 when he won re-election. $72 million. Probably gonna take 15 to 20 million dollars to get in this race. You know what I mean? By the end, I'm talking about the general election. So here's, here, here, here's the narrative. Number one, who has a personal story to tell that resonates with voters? Because I don't think it's just going to be based on issues alone. Will the Democrats get involved in a bitter inner nice fight? Because if they agree on most of the issues, they're going to have to find something that, that in which they can differentiate. Does that mean they go after each other? I'm not saying they will. Democrats are not known to play nice all the time. You know, they have a long history of getting involved in some, ask Bob Casey and Ed Rendell when they had a pretty bitter primary for the governorship in 2002, the only election that Senator Casey uh, lost when he ran for uh, governor trying to succeed his dad uh, for the first time. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's a big issue. Money, message, narrative, and no one at this point has a clue who's likely to prevail. But I'll tell you something other fascinating. Every single candidate but one is, lives east of the Susquehanna River, and the one lives within a Tiger Woods Drive of the Susquehanna River. <laughs> I'm kidding. You all follow this? So there is a possibility that one Western Democrat will run, a guy named Jack Wagner, who was Auditor General. And, we, and what happens if we get a crowded field in the east Three of them all live in the Philly Burbs. Three of the four top-tier candidates live in the Philly Burbs, the other one over here in New York. And maybe Wolf can do something that a guy named George Leader did. We'll have to wait and see. So I'm out of time. I don't know if we have any time for questions. I can go home. I'm <laughs> I didn't start the War of the Roses so I can drive back across that river. <laughs> he says two questions. So I'll take one from this side of the room and one Anybody you want to sit there? Yes, sir. Uh, this has to do with uh, the president. Uh, in my travels overseas in the Middle East, um, we saw that President Obama got a nice reception in South Africa. In my conversations with people, as I say, in my travels in the Middle East, uh, we are, my conversations, see him as very as a very weak leader in the United States is in a weak position of leadership. Uh, I, I'm just interested in what your comments yeah. in terms of polling and the question has to do with the president's uh, uh, the attitude of folks in the Middle East, Middle Eastern countries towards the president because the uh, questioner suggests that he's viewed as as as, as somewhat weak. I, I don't think there's any doubt that he tried to change the narrative, change the way uh, folks in the Middle East thought about us after Iraq and after Afghanistan. I don't think there's any doubt about that. The 
question is, in the long run, does it work? It, it, it does, this new approach, which is, has a less visible <coughs> imprint, footprint of America in the Middle East likely to work or not. I don't know that we know that or not. He does have a lot of critics, particularly uh, supporters of Israel, questions whether the Iraq, whether any, deal, any dealings with Iran will lead to uh, the Iranians giving up uh, nuclear weapons or not, the question of, of whether or not uh, countries that, had, that were part of the Arab Spring are, are more stable or not. Uh, it doesn't look like they are. Uh, but I, I do think he has weakened and lessened America's presence in the Middle East, whether in the long run it works or not. I don't know. Anyone over there? Yes, sir, go ahead. Why do you say the transportation bill would be a positive for the Republican administration, given the cost per taxpayer? That That's a great question. I'll tell you why. I've polled on this extensively. The voters of our state overwhelmingly support it. They're willing to pay two and a half to three dollars more a week uh, in your gasoline bill. Uh, I do not think that by the time the election takes place that the full manifestation of whatever the price increase, and I do think that gasoline station owners and dealers will pass along the cost, but I think the administration has a political asset because it can go to every road and every bridge and every legislative district and talk about how this bridge is unsafe and how it needs to be repaired how roads that have cost people a lot of more gasoline money sitting in traffic congestions will be improved and how they're safer. And I've done a lot of extensive polling in this. I think, I personally think it's a net plus. I'm not going to argue that it's going to increase fees. Uh, but I think in the long run, uh, certainly by the end of next year, I think when they begin to have projects identified, when they can talk about what that will mean, uh, to the residents, I think in the long run it'll, it, it, it will be helpful. I mean, there's disagreement on this. I understand it, if, if, if you do. But the polling on that is pretty simple. Of all the governor's priorities, roads and bridges, cell liquor stores, and the pensions, that has the highest salience and the highest interest and in, in support among, among voters. So we'll have to see. I mean, it may be related to the price of gasoline, and no one will really know, as you know, if gasoline prices go up, how much of that is due to the lifting of the wholesale gasoline tax? We'll have to wait to find out. But I think on balance. But more importantly, and I'm, you know, I try to be neutral, but I've done, I, one of the few issues that I felt very strongly about is the need to do this. We cannot have 25% of our bridges structurally in disrepair. We cannot have 7,000 miles of roads that are falling apart. If you're, many of you are business folks. We're not going to attract people here. What business? is going to come into Pennsylvania when, and up in the northern part of the state where the roads were not great to begin with, we got these big rigs pulling all these uh, all this equipment to do the fracking. If we want to do this, we have to have an infrastructure that supports it. So that's my only editorial comment. As always, thanks for having me.